G'day, Keithy here, thanks for joining me again. Beautiful spot up here, Crystal Beach, North Queensland, you can't go past it. It's one of the few beaches that you can actually drive on um, if you take your time with the tides and whatnot. It's a lovely afternoon for it. So that's why I brought you here, so we can have a bit of a look over the Range Rover. Since about five years ago when I did the last introduction to the Range Rover video, a fair bit's changed, so I thought it was time to bring you along somewhere really pretty like Crystal Beach, and we can have a bit more of a chat about what's changed in the Range Rover, what I've done, and we'll do a full go around of the old girl. Stick around. Start off with the snorkel here. This is a four inch stainless snorkel. I had this made up, uh, it would have been before this vehicle's first Cape trip, so probably five years ago now, to be honest. I love this snorkel. It's fantastic, it's done its job. It's done its job very well. You can see it follows the contours of the car pretty nice. Obviously with a custom snorkel, it's not gonna look absolutely perfect, but I think it looks all right, given it's about, yeah, five years old now. If you follow it up the top, you'll notice that I've got a, uh, so it was actually a sock, believe it or not, up the top here. Now you might know this, some of you might have some experience with stainless snorkels before, but when it rains, and it's got to rain really heavy, I actually get water into the snorkel and it doesn't drain out of the airbox quick enough and snuffs the car out. So if any of you have had something like this in the past, let me know, because what I've had to do for now at least is just put this sock over the top of the snorkel so that when it does rain really heavy, it sort of hits the sock and then runs down rather than going into the, um, the air box there. About the only gripe I've got for the snorkel, otherwise fantastic. I've taken it up to Cape York a number of times. So it's been through water crossings about yay deep. It's even been stuck in water crossings about yay deep. Uh, and it's been absolutely flawless. Other than that issue, ingesting a little bit of water, I haven't had a problem with it. So I've moved you up the back here to the rear bumper. And I've done that on purpose because I had a bit of a shenanigan going on when I was getting recovered from one of the crossings that I went into uh, at the Four Wheel Drive Club's farm. This is probably still going back three or four years there. Um, I actually lost the little bit of plastic molding that was on the bumper here and my um, rear mudguard off the car at the time. Unfortunately, I haven't repaired it yet, but it's the perfect spot to put the little drain from the awning there. So I've left it for that. I have got the little plastic covering to put on there. I really should get to doing that, but I thought I'd show you a little bit of a shame video. Next up, we've got this Foxwing awning. Now I've had this awning for about 15 years now. It's lived on this Range Rover. I've only taken it off a number of times. If I was gonna leave the car on the driveway for a couple of weeks or months, or just simply didn't need it, then I'd take the Foxwing awning off. It only takes two bolts and she's off very easy. For a 13 year old awning, this is fantastic. I'll take you for a walk through. Personally, I dislike these poles because they do bend quite easily. They still work, mind you, but they're not perfect. And the fact that you need to use poles and ropes compared to some of the other awnings you can get where you don't even need poles unless it's extremely windy. As you can see on the beach here, there's hardly any breeze at all. With any other awning, you wouldn't need poles, but at the moment with the Foxwing, anytime you set it up, you're gonna need the poles to go up. I do like that it sits higher than the car, especially for those who have roof racks and they like to use the side of their car or even for people with tailgates, the fold up type tailgates that I've got, it makes it so much better. Now, if I didn't have the step up on here, the rear door would open further. But as you can see here, with my car in low height, the lowest height it'll go, I can still get my head underneath this door. In fact, I can jump on the tailgate, sit down, have a drink, have some food, and not touch the rear door with my head. There's plenty of room there. It also makes it nice and easy to get into the drawer system, pull out the fridge, everything like that. It's quite a nice height up. What I've done, I've also added a couple of Velcro strips. They don't look amazing, but they do the job so that I can have some LED lighting, just a couple of little light strips. If I want a bit of light on the camp, I can put it further out. 
if I want it up underneath the car here, I can just simply move it and hang it through something if I want to. Would I recommend this awning? Absolutely. I think for what it is and what it has done for me for 13 years, there are no holes in it, there is no damage to it, there's no mold on it, and I've set this awning up when it's been extremely, extremely wet and left it for quite a long time, a number of times without opening up. There's even been times when I have opened it up and there's still water in it, and I've never, ever, ever had mold on this awning. So 10 out of 10 for Foxwing awning. Obviously the only gripe that I have is the fact that you do need to use the poles every time, but as you'll see in this video, it only took me a short time to set up. It's not that much of a problem. The added bonus of this Foxwing awning is that my Oz tent can zip up to the zipper on the awning. Now, given that they're made by the same company, they have the same zipper on the front. If you go all the way to the end, you can put the awning from the Oz tent into the awning on the car and actually zip it up which I have done a number of times, and that way you've essentially got a double awning on your tent. So the first thing I wanna show you on the back end is these light guards. They've been on the car, the previous owner actually put them on. The bloke that I bought this car off installed them. They've been fantastic. As you can see, they've had a bit of a buff and a hit every now and then. They've done their job. I've never had damage to any of these tail lights in the car. So we move down here, and this isn't a standard Range Rover option. This is a standard rear tailgate though, I will say. These lights here were installed by the bloke that I bought the Range Rover off, funny enough. They're LED, as you'll see in a second. Fantastic lights. They've been on this vehicle for about 10 years now. To my knowledge, 10 years. I've owned it for about seven or eight now, so it's been on there longer than that. It also has LEDs for the number plate lights. You'll notice a little bit of damage on the rear bumper, as we mentioned around the corner there before. Goes across onto this side where we have the strut for the spare wheel carrier. Now admittedly that strut actually needs to probably be regassed, but it's a fantastic thing to to have on here. It automatically does push the um, the spare tire open. We have the reversing light here. This is also a camp light so it's on a switch here. So I can turn it on. I can have it run when the car is in reverse or I can just switch it off altogether if I don't want it to run at all. Also on the back, after Squeaky opens his way up, the wiring, if you follow it up, also goes to my two-way radio aerial antenna, I should say. So usually when I'm on a trip, I'll take the little aerial off here and I'll put my tall one on. This one here is perfect just for small trips, little beach ones where you're not too far away from the next person. And it's also a lot easier to get this awning open when the small one's on here because the big one does sort of push it up a little bit. You might think my Range Rover is sitting pretty low at the moment, but I've actually got air suspension in this thing, and that is a factory item. I haven't done anything but give it a two inch suspension lift by putting spaces underneath the airbags, and also done a few little things. I've got a video on it up there if you want to have, oh, that way, sorry. If you want to have a look at that. This is in the lowest height that I've got, which is really good for awnings and camping and whatnot, getting into the fridge and whatnot. And it also misses these 33 inch tires, which have been on this thing for about five years now. I'm doing a video on that one really soon to talk about them. Um, I think they've been a good tire so far. They're getting a little bit noisy, but they've done everything I asked for. I haven't even let them down to drive on the beach to get here today. They're good on the dirt. They're good on the sand. They're good in the mud. They're good on the road. They really are. Apart from this end of year noise that I'm getting out of them, which you'll hear about probably next week. They've been a fantastic tire. I've got them on a 16 by eight inch steel wheel. Um, personally, I would go back to an alloy if I can, but I had to get a steel wheel to run these wheels because at the time I had an 18 inch um, alloy wheel and obviously the 33s weren't available in the KM3s and the BF Goodrich KM3s at that time. You've probably also seen the tire pressure monitoring system video that I did. So again, all, um, all of my tires, including the spare, run that system. That's an internal system. It's not just a valve cap that tells you what the pressure is of your wheel. Um, fantastic, again, five years old, no problems. Tells you every time you start to key, oh, yep, you got air in your tires, no worries. Air pressure goes down, it lets you know. It actually gave me an alarm one day when my tires were getting too hot. Another good thing, you can adjust the temperature setting on them. So all in all, pretty good little setup, doing very well. Like I said, drove up here on the beach, no worries at all today right on high tide. Fantastic. Let's go and have a look at what we've got up the front. So we'll start up here with the bull bar. This is a factory Land Rover option for this vehicle when it was brand new and it's been on there for 21 years, this bull bar. Done very well. It is uh, steel with a rubber coating. 
so it's actually soft on the outside. Uh, it's not a bad thing for something that's 21 years old. It actually looks pretty good still. I found out the hard way that you've got to be gentle with it when you're putting fishing rod holders on. So I actually put this really dodgy looking thing underneath like a shield to stop cutting into the, um, the rubbery part. But otherwise, fantastic. I've hit a few animals with this one uh, and it has lasted a lot better than the animals, which is great. Down here, these are standard lights. So for this year model, there was like a black surround around the headlights in the P38. And it also came with the clear indicator globes, whatever you want to call them, the covers. That was for the later model Range Rovers. That was a standard option. I've also got the Land Rover option um, headlight protectors. So they are the same brand and whatnot as what fitted to the rear of this thing. Uh, they've been good. There's one over here that has copped a little bit. I think one of the kids jumped up and just snapped a little guard on it. Naughty little kids. It has got standard, uh, what are those things called? Comment down below. Fog lights. Fog lights are what they're called. Standard fog lights on this thing. They didn't light the off-road too much actually. I think it was more, um, I may have actually run into something off-road and this one here came out. It wasn't happy with life. I managed to fix up the um, surrounding on it anyway and it's back on there living happily. Down the front we've got my Nava spotlights. These are the spotlights that were on this Range Rover when I bought it. They've been fantastic. They still work perfectly. They're not the brightest uh, spotlights you could possibly buy. You can definitely buy something a lot brighter than this. But for what they are, they are much better than just having the high beams alone on a really bad night. They get you a lot more view. So I'm fantastic. I'm fantastic. They're fantastic. I'm really happy with them. And if I had to, I'd go with them again because I don't really believe in having spotlights that will light from here to the bottom of Earth. I think something that just gives you a little bit more light and distance is um, fine. And that's exactly what these Navas do. There's nothing else to show you on the front end here, but I thought I'd show you the beach again because the sun's just about down now and it's looking amazing. What an amazing afternoon. Just about to hit high tide now. Okay, now, so we'll go in the back. James Bond style. We'll start up the top and work our way down from here now there's LED lighting up the top here. You can slightly see the reflection of the light on my hand. You see it much better at night, I'll let you know that. From there we go down. The first thing you notice is the draw system. Not everybody's got a draw system. Do I like it? Yes, I do. It does have its downsides as well. It's very hard to, well, it's not very hard, it's just awkward to get it out if I did want to use the back of the car for whatever reason. But otherwise, it's already set up and ready to go at moment's notice. Hence, we came here, the only thing I had to add was the gas uh, cooker. Everything else is in there, so I am ready to cook, I'm ready to eat dinner, have coffee, all of that kind of stuff, and I don't have to put anything extra in this car. It always has all of that stuff in there. We've got uh, normally all of my cooking stuff up here, so cups and it's a little extra like tin food type stuff. Um, I've also got things like mozzie spray and um, dishwashing liquid and whatnot in there. Down here is more tooly stuff, so I'll have the cover for my pan so I can cook steaks or whatever. Um, I've also got some spare stuff, some, some parts for the suspension and little tiddly stuff that might come in handy for camping spares, some plastic bags, etc. Then you come over to this drawer here. This is where I've just got purely tools and items like that. A couple of hockey straps. I've got a snatch strap in there. I've got the, um, I can't remember the name of that now, but I'm sure you do. Fits in there lovely as well. All my tools for removing the wheels. Everything's in there. I've even got gloves. I've got my air compressor and line, um, spare fuses, etc. things like that. The fridge, you've probably seen this before. I've had this fridge for a number of years now, very handy. Runs off the second battery, which is in here. So in here, we've got quite a lot of things and I've already mentioned it in the, in the original tour of this vehicle um, video five odd years ago. The second battery lives in here. Now I've got a 140 amp hour battery in the back of this thing. My two-way radio is in there as well. I've also got a projector controller. So I previously had, I believe it was, oh actually I can't remember the one that I previously had. 
I used to have a different controller on there. I'll put the name of it, the brand down there. The reason that I changed to this projector is because I can put more um, voltage off solar into the battery via the projector charger than I could with my previous one. So I upgraded it. It is still only a small um, charger. The projector, I believe that's a 25 amp. So not a lot, you don't need a lot in my opinion. Uh, it's always been perfect for me. I've still got the, the gauge here to check the voltage anyway. So if something was going on, I could have a look. I've got my air compressor switch here. That's always been there and it hasn't changed. I've got three outlets here, 12 volt outlets, so I can plug other objects, chargers, anything like that into there. And that comes off the second battery. This here is my fridge outlet switch. I've got uh, another Anderson plug here to put solar in. Say the solar on the roof wasn't doing well enough. I could run some solar panels out into a sunny spot and plug them in from there. And then we come to this. You may have seen it before, you may not have. I think this is an absolutely fantastic little invention. This is the rear door table. And I've had this in here for, yeah, probably about five years again, maybe even longer than five years now, might be six years. I made this myself. Um, I didn't actually know if it was a thing or not back in the day. It's very simple. It's held on there with these clips. I've got four points where I could screw them on. I found that I only need to screw it on one each side in order to keep it secure. And because as you lift the door, it sort of follows the the guard along with it so it needs that little bit of freedom to move goes on and off very easily only takes a second to set up with this side here i don't actually need to take that all the way off i just unscrew it a tiny little bit then you can lift him up and pull him out and then if you come over to this side of the vehicle I have tent poles. They're homemade tent poles. So I made these again when this table was made. They sit there perfect, just like that. So obviously I'd put the second one in if I was gonna leave this up for some time. Bob's your uncle. Lovely little place to cook from and it allows access to the drawers over there and the fridge without being obstructive. It's still underneath the light and it's still underneath the shelter as well. Another question I got all the time on the YouTube channel was, how do you get into the fridge? Well, it's actually on a slider, which is incorporated into the drawer system. It slides out just like that. In you get, get out your cold drink, whatever you've got going on in here, food, lid down, in she goes. Just like that. All right, so if we come up onto the roof rack setup, you can see a little bit better on what's going on up here. The solar panel you guys know about, I've had this on here for a million years. Fantastic, love it for park the car in the sun, charges the battery, does exactly what it wants to do. In a good sunny area, unlike where I'm parked right now, I'll get a good probably four or five days before I even need to worry about starting the engine with that fridge running. So that's an amazing little thing. That's only 120 or 100 watt, I believe it's a 100 watt panel. The roof rack you've seen before, this cost me about 150 bucks to make. I did it myself. I've got the video up there, I believe I did a video on it. Have a look at that if you're interested in seeing how to do yourself a cheap little setup. I've had this on there for a million years. I've been up here to get things off the roof rack. You'll see pretty much, well, every video. I've had the awning up here and it's never come off the car. Fantastic, what's the problem with it? Okay, it's not good at taking direct weight on each of these little sections. So as you can see here, this one here is a little bit bent. I've obviously put my foot on there at some stage with a lot of weight on and I've bent it a little bit. Otherwise, as long as I'm standing on top of these uh, rack bars, it's okay, it can handle the weight, but unfortunately it can't handle a lot of weight directly on each of the little crossbars, but it's been fantastic. I put my Oz 10 up there every time I go camping, chairs, things like that, and it takes the weight of all of that kind of camping furniture, no worries. It's also really good to attach the awning, the Foxwing awning, as you can see, we're looking from above now, and I can put the strap on these little eye bolts, tighten them up, they're strong enough to hold the awning, they're strong enough to hold ropes when I've got to strap something down, like my tent, for example, 
So I think for 130 bucks, that's a great little investment and it's very light, which is the main reason that I did it. I can lift this entire roof rack setup, including the solar panel from the vehicle on my own without needing any help. In the rear of the Range Rover, nothing special. As you can see, I've got my drone there and the charger. Now, if we go in here and I open up this particular seat you'll notice that i've got my arb compressor there so that controls the air locker and it also pumps to the tank i can use that to inflate tires as well there's quite a lot of room here so i can put bags while we're traveling in the back here or anything i want to hide from the kids soccer balls a little bit of camping gear there's plenty of room in there for all of that kind of stuff which is a great little use of the area otherwise it is all range rover in here with nothing extra added to it in good condition as you see plenty of room to fit all the camping gear chairs and whatnot on the floor and still have some foot room otherwise they can also go up on the back there so as with the back we've got the leather everywhere and all the timber and everything in the Range Rover as it is a Range Rover I just keep my umbrella and first aid kit here and obviously the COVID mask because everybody needs a COVID mask. Couple of shopping bags there ready to go. Leather inside. The first thing that you can see from here, this is the gas tank fuel gauge. So those little dots light up to tell me how much gas I've got remaining in the tank. If I have the switch facing this way, the engine's running on gas. If I have the switch this way, the engine is running on petrol and that gas system has been in there for a number of years i used it to drive up here no worries cost me about 80 bucks a week to drive this thing around on a tank of gas so it's much cheaper than driving it around on petrol and i can't recall the last time i actually filled up with petrol this thing has been months number of months let's go inside and have a little bit more of a closer look here so the dash is all standard in here i haven't done anything with that so we come into the Range Rover, as you can see there, I'm in low range at the moment. If I was over this side, I would be in high range. Being an auto, fantastic little lever, works every time. Some people have problem. We've got sports mode there. If I'm in high range, and it actually puts the gearbox in manual if I'm in auto mode, so it'll hold the gears. Um, yeah, it's actually really fantastic. All standard here. This is the audio system and the aircon and uh, What's that thing called? Climate control controls, aircon, all that kind of stuff. You know what that looks like, CD. Up here, this system has remained unchanged. So this is this little outlet up there for my tire pressure monitoring system. Actually, no, I lie. That is for the Uniden. It's my dash cam PowerPoint. I've got a little outlet here if I want to use that one or I can use this one here as well rear air locker switch and this one here off uh, when I'm running the thermo fans up the front if I have it down it'll run the aircon thermo fan if I have it switched up it'll run the engine thermo fan that's a setup that I made some time ago there's a video up on the top of your screen if you want to have a look at that you'll also notice that the handle of my two-way radio lives up here sits quite nicely on top of the trailer brake control. This is a Tekensha Prodigy. I think it's called a P1 these days. This thing has been in my vehicle for the entire time I've owned it and the previous owner put it in for towing. Fantastic if you're towing big loads. I really recommend having something like that. If we go up and you've watched my previous videos, you'd know all about this one here. This tells the temperature of the vehicle. So this is a thermo fan control unit. When the engine is switched on, this will glow and it'll tell me the temperature of the coolant. I can set it to run as thermofan at slow speed or at high speed using that controller there. So that's pretty high tech. I've got a video up, where are we, about here somewhere. If you want to have a look at that, it was a pretty high tech little, it's a four part series. And it was very interesting and they're still ongoing, but it's a fantastic little setup. You notice this one here, so you can put your mobile phones into that one. I use that when I'm using the HEMA or GPS. Put the phone in there, set it up there, and it'll tell me where I need to go, turn when I've got to turn. Absolutely fantastic thing. The, the HEMA also does your tracking, your off-road stuff, of course, so you don't need to have phone reception with the HEMA to make it work. 
up top is pretty standard so you've got your mirror there that one is one of those special ones that does all the magic at night when someone points their headlights at you you can see the beautiful beach in the background there and then the dash cam there i've had that in for a million years funny little thing uh it lives in the heat and it still works which is really good it saved my bacon Okay, so the last place we're gonna have a bit of a look around is the engine bay. First thing you'll notice is that I've got a couple of little relay holders here. So these ones here make the thermofan run between high and low speed in auto when I have the thermofan installed. At the moment, I don't have the thermofan installed. I've also got the AC fans wired up to this so I can use a switch inside the car to turn those on if I want to. If you follow this along here, it goes to a temperature switch mounted in the coolant top hose. So this measures the temperature of the coolant, basically what's going on in the engine. So I can just see what's happening other than what the little gauge is telling you. I'm sure if you've got a newish car, you know they normally just sit in the middle and that's it. They don't really tell you the in-between stuff. That's really handy so you can tell if things are getting a little bit warm and whatnot. Gives me the opportunity to turn on this AC thermofan on the front of the thing on a hot day up in North Queensland. Which is good if you sit there idling when the thing's running, it's not too bad, but it's the idling with this big V8 that she doesn't like. Then we move back, you can see that's shiny, so that's my alternator. If you watch the videos, you will have seen I replaced that last year, before I even knew that I had cancer. On top of the motor here, it looks rather messy. It's not, despite what it looks like, that's all the LPG system. So this, as mentioned before, runs on both LPG and on gas. And up here is all of the gas injectors for this big V8. Unfortunately, because it's not a factory gas system, it looks a little bit worse than what it would have been if it was factory, but it does the job. I drove here on gas, as I mentioned, it's fantastic. It's a lot cheaper to run on gas. So it's definitely staying. If gas was not available for me, I would probably remove that system purely because it takes up so much space. It makes it very awkward working on the engine, doing any kind of repairs. We move over here. This is where I can hook up to pump up the tires. So I get the air from my air compressor in the back of the car, runs all the way down to this and it's filtered. Up here, I've got my airbag suspension override valve. So if something goes wrong with the suspension, I can manually pump up each of the airbags and also the tank that's underneath the vehicle if I want to. Can also use that tank to pump up tires in an emergency off this if I had to. So other than the LPG gear and a couple of little things that I've added, this is completely standard. Obviously it looks dodgy with all the LPG stuff up there. And this wasn't from me. All of this is not oil that's leaked or anything like that. It's actually a, pro a protectant agent that was sprayed over this motor before I owned it. Uh, so that if water got into the engine bay at all, it didn't affect any of the, the way that things operate. But unfortunately, when it was sprayed on there, you don't need to worry about getting your intake manifold or any of that wet. It's not going to hurt it unless it has a leak. I think really there's only a couple of items in here that would have needed that and that'd be your alternator and maybe your aircon pump. Your power steering pump should be pretty right and all of that. So I guess it's a bit of overkill uh, by the person that did it, but it's still there and you've got to love it. It's not going anywhere. So as dirty as it does look in here, that's actually the protecting agency that makes it look like that. Okay, so the sun's about to go down. What a beautiful afternoon for it. Beautiful day. Thanks to everybody for having a bit of a look at the video on the Range Rover. This is an update video. If you go back to there, you'll see the video, the original video for the tour of this Range Rover. That was about five years ago now, so a lot can happen in five years. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you've got any questions, or if you wanna know any more, feel free to sing out. I've got a tyre video coming up very soon if you're interested in what these KM3 BF Goodrich mud terrains are doing. Otherwise, thanks for joining me and we'll see you next time. Take care.